Welcome to the High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today, we're joined by the Director of Strength and Conditioning for the San Jose Sharks, Mike Potenza. Mike is currently in his 16th season as the San Jose Sharks Strength and Conditioning Coordinator. He's responsible for the team's overall strength and conditioning programs, including the creation of individualized postseason workout programs and the assistance of rehabilitation efforts for all injured players. Before coming to San Jose, Mike served as a strength and conditioning coach for the University of Wisconsin men's and women's hockey teams, both of which were 2006 NCAA national champions. A 2000 Springfield College graduate, Mike earned his bachelor's of science degree in applied exercise science. He also attained a master's degree from Boston University in physical education with a concentration in human movement science. Mike was a part of the evaluation staff for the U.S. World Junior Hockey Team that competed at the 2008 World Junior Championships in the Czech Republic. His responsibilities included offering presentations on nutrition and recovery, administering testing, and performance evaluations. Unbelievable conversation that we had with Mike today. We talked about sustainability in high-performance hockey. We talked about the contrast and the difference in development versus the difference in managing in-season versus off-season. We also chat about communicating metrics to players and staff. And finally, we talk about SCAF, the Strength and Conditioning Association of Professional Hockey, of which Mike serves as the president. Fantastic conversation. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Absolutely. It's been a little while since we we spoke last, but we're really privileged to have you on. You've been doing this for a long time and uh, really value your opinion and feedback. So it should be a really fun hour for our listeners. I had the opportunity to speak to, to two people that have also done this for a very long time. Recently, Reg Grant, 17 years with the New York Rangers. Yep. Pete Friesen, 21 years. You are currently... 16 years with one club. That's absolutely outstanding. Uh, yeah. First of all, uh, very rare in today's game. I'm going to ask the same question that I asked these gentlemen. Sustainability, obviously content knowledge. I know you're a smart person. What are the intangible tangibles that you feel keep you in a position like this for so long? Well, I think first and foremost, I found some good hiding spots when the shit hit the fan. So, <laughs> so I, I really, Brilliant. I love it. it find me, you know, to, to, to kind of get pissed. So um, anyway, but uh, I, I really think, you know, I, and as I get older, you know, it's like you, it, it's a great company to, to be in that's that kind of year serve spaces, Reg and Pete and Sean Skane's got 18 years in this league yep. and, Roger Takahashi and David Good have 20 plus years. Mark Nemish has 20 plus years. And and guys, for staff guys, forgive me if I'm missing anybody, you know. But um, we, you know, we do always want to promote uh, and and recognize those guys because it is a grind. And and it sounds cliche, but communication is so important, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I don't know if we as performance coaches appreciate enough how many areas we touch in an organization or in a collegiate system or in in, in even a, even the private sector, you know, we, we are talking to the doctors, we are talking to the athletic therapists, we're in charge of portions of rehab, if not 75% of the rehab, especially the return to play. We're talking with coaches on player performance, but then also practice performance and then travel. And then we're talking to the nutritionist, you know, for, for meals. And then we're talking to the development guys, we're talking to the American League, we're talking to the scouts, and then we go to the combine and we talk to them. And then, you know, to top it off with the cherry on top, we're talking to management. Right. Not only on players, but where the young players are going and how we project those. So if you look at that, you know, I think I have a slide in one of my presentations, the spider graph of how many areas we touch in, in, in the time frame that we commit to. We have to communicate with all these areas. And sometimes with a unifying voice that brings all the different areas together, you know, so that everybody is in the is in the know. That's essentially what both individuals spoke about, that being Pete and Reg, communication and empathy being a part of a team, helping others around you, communicating, having a heat meter, knowing when not to speak to, (laughs) you know, there's some of the changes that now that you're seeing in the, in the landscape. So 16 years, rewind that time to where we're at currently. 
Yeah. Probably a lot of different changes. I, I don't know if maybe you can speak from your experience. Is it changes in the construction of a high performance model? Is it a push more now towards being more objective than ever? What are the changes in the 16 now going on 16 years that you've been doing this in terms and measures of high performance in hockey? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll answer your question from two different areas. One being that the, the staffing of the performance team, you know, 16 years ago, my first year, we were one of the only teams that had an American League part-time strength coach. You wow. know, that's scary, right? And then we didn't, yeah. nobody had an assistant in, in the NHL. So, you know, we, we quickly at that period, four years later, after my, you know, four years into this job, everybody had a full-time NA, American League strength coach, which we had then to, we had to add that. It was groundbreaking, if you will, and everybody was doing it. So we needed to, to fund that position, you know, especially yep. if it was a development type position. And then we started to see more teams get an assistant, right? You know, you can't, you can't put the performance director or head strength coach or whatever the title is, you can't make them wear so many different hats, right? Or, sure. or in so many plates because some of them are going to fall, right? And, and that, that's, not, that's not quality and that's not how you're going to achieve your goals as an organization, right? So we've seen now, we've gotten to the point where there are high performance structures. Some teams have two assistants, teams have a nutritionist. Every team has, you know, a full-time American League strength coach. You know, and, and some teams have an analytics group that specifically deals with performance, not just on the hockey analytics data side. Um, but, but, you know, you've seen this big evolution. I think in the game and the way we've programmed or, or things that we've had to worry about, my first year was 06 here. And, and I just left Wisconsin. And there, they were probably a year and a half or two years from that lockout, I think, in 04, 05. My yep. dates are so the rules changes then put a premium on speed. Right, because D can't couldn't hold up the, the the forward anymore and pin them against the wall and shut the play down. Right, so they had to skate, but then the forwards were encouraged. Okay, now put the pressure on them and obviously skate and attack and things like that. So I saw the game was fast already for me, just coming to this level and being around it every day. Sure. But what was interesting was that at this simultaneously, I saw players with a little bit less skill level who were fast as shit be able to stay longer. But guys who are slower and a little bit older in their age, and unfortunately, their skating didn't improve or catch up to the rules, they had to retire. And, and that was Jonathan Chichu. You yep. know, and John was still a good friend, coaches here in the, the youth system and coached my kids. And, but even, uh, I think even he would say, you know, it's like I should have worked more on my skating, you know, towards the end. You know, it just got, it got so fast, right? So those kind of changes were, were obviously really important. The next kind of wave, probably eight years into my, my time, halfway through my time was, okay, now the data is coming, right? Sure. So everybody wanted to use the catapult data for good purposes. Those who were using heart rate monitoring like us, they were trying to use a little bit more of the acute to chronic models and find out, okay, so this is our metric. If this is what we're going to invest in and not the expensive catapult system or Connexon or whatever, how do we use it for our benefit? And now we're fully into like, you know, this everybody wants to see the data first, you know, and it's like, tell me the data. And then when I walk away, tell me about the intangibles of the player sometimes, you know? Yeah. So, but you can't forget those, right? You know, the coach's eye and the, the, the coach's gut, you know, is still very, very much uh, very important. And it's a thing that you can't discard just because of the performance numbers. You know, sometimes the performance numbers don't tell you everything, you know? Sure. An example would be, I have a couple of players who are, amazing and they're our fastest players maybe three of them right mm -hmm. yet they're they're young enough where they don't know the system you know to where it's just a habit right so if i get questions like this guy looks slow i'm like the guy doesn't know the system yet you know so he's, he's trying not to screw up so sure. we have to take it with a grain of salt and and make sure we put some context to those numbers um do we look at those numbers as a point of okay make sure they don't drop off absolutely you know absolutely it's interesting. Uh, in, in terms of your opinion, where do you sit right now? And I don't want to ask a loaded question. I ask this really with all of our performance directors, specifically, you know, strength and conditioning coaches. Where do you sit right now with this data element versus gut feeling element? I think they're both important. Don't get me wrong. I have two questions based on that. Where do you think the pendulum is swinging right now with that? And then do you feel as a strength and conditioning coach coming up now, it's important to also have areas, not just in terms of being able to, to, to program in the weight room, but also having a borderline understanding of 
perhaps you know rudimentary statistics, you know, central yeah. tendency, spread, error, or do you feel those should be more uh, bucketed positions within the performance staff? That's a great question. I think that's kind of where the profession is most certainly going. And if you don't have the ability to hire someone to do that stuff, then you're going to have to take on something like that on your own. I'm a sure. prime example. And, and, you know, my reporting early on to management and coaches in season, because that's a yep. real specific one, um, you know, a little sideway segue is kind of like you and I are going to talk in Mount Tremblant this summer, right? And Scotty yep. asked me, what's your topic going to be? I'm like, well, I kind of want to talk about like evaluation and, and kind of how we look at our performance, our, our performance testing data, both at the combine in season and at development camp and how you structure that sheet and speed coach really. Sure. And um, I think it'd be very valuable for people because at the beginning I, I didn't, I just thought I was talking about numbers, but then like you said, there's a, there's a deeper context that I had to come to learn sure. and then back and compare to uh, from older players who are physically gifted and those who aren't and as to the players getting up. So just a side note, which I think is a pretty cool thing that I'm excited to talk about. But uh, I had this data set, right? And um, I had to f figure out a way, how am I going to communicate this? In the beginning, my reporting was all subjective to kind of I, things that I found this player's working really hard in the gym. He's maintaining his weight. You know, I think we can get him a little bit more speed work to, to gain an advantage on the, you know, the, the bad testing score he kind of came in with at the beginning of the year, you know, yep. something like that. And then I really leaned on kind of, okay, well, can, how can I look at like some of the testing or I don't, I don't like to call it testing in the middle of the season because the players then, you know, yeah. go get pissed, right? I'm like, <laughs> it's just a workout. It's just a workout that we're just going to track these numbers every month. <laughs> I you love know? it. Yeah. So, so I do that and then kind of lay those out in kind of a spreadsheet and explain yep. the areas and make sure I, the, the uh, management coaches don't see any drop offs, you know, 10% is kind of our marker, you know, we don't yep. want to, we don't want to lose more than 10%, you know, on a 30 inch vertical jump, that's going to be 30. So we, we, and then another 30, maybe the next month is 27. That's a big loss for that particular type player. And anybody sure. 27 is going to go down to like a 25, right? Or even yep. more. So that's even, even less. So we can talk about those types of exercises that we track during the year later, but I wanted to make sure I can show management coaches over the, over time, how they're dropping. Right. Sure. Now, statistically, my Excel level of knowledge, you know, hit a ceiling before Kevin Neal and I worked together and sure. He's been, you know, obviously he's an amazing friend to both of us and he's a hell of a, a teacher and, and has tremendous experiences. So I, I really raised my, my game and learned from Kevin as we built these kind of profiles for each of these testing areas. So I most certainly got better at Excel. I most certainly had a kind of a, you know, office, you know, a, an, an assistant slash coworker that, help me with the statistical side. If I could go back, I would most certainly take more time on the statistic side, you know, because, because again, you, <clears throat> you pretty much have to do it on your own sometimes if you don't have those department resources and not everybody has the department resources. I know we most certainly don't. So I've kind of looked to other, other um, people to help me out to kind of it, continue to continue to do where, where the where the field is going, but also for my the betterment of my knowledge. Absolutely, and I think it's in interesting too the way you've learned, obviously from Kev and the people that you've been around. But good to know and need to know. Sometimes you need to know that stuff, and you teach yeah. yourself it. You're not you're essentially teaching yourself on the go what's important, what's not. I don't want, again. I, I want to ask another question before we get in the, the meat and potatoes of development versus management, in season versus off season. But there's been a real big push in analytics, right? And uh, a lot of people, and again, I don't think this is it. There's anything wrong with this. I'm asking your opinion. I'm not suggesting that you needed to play the game of hockey to mm -hmm. be good at this, but do you feel that there's got to be a context? There's got to be a, a there's got to be an understanding of the technical and tactical aspects to bring that quote unquote data to life. If not, it's just numbers. Mm -hmm. Or do you do you feel, hey, Ant, I, I don't really care. Just give me the numbers and I'll put them in context. Does that make yeah. sense? I, I think it's. Yes, 100%. Like, I, I do think there's a context that you have to uncover when you look at the numbers. You can't just present the numbers. And there are, there are teams I, I know that are just, just getting the numbers. Now, I'm probably, if I can hire a statistical sports science kind of mind, sure. I would certainly say, hey, look, this is what I want to see. Grab the numbers. Here's yep. where I want to go. And then hopefully that person coming in has has a solid base of knowledge and be like, Hey, Mike, why don't we look at this too, to kind of, um, 
help the thought process along, you know, which, which would be great. I, you know, there was, there was an example. I'll share this with you. It's kind of funny. Cause it was like within the last two weeks, a coach, one of our co- assistant coaches gave me an example. Every coaching staff I've had has been really into what we do off ice. And it's only gotten over the years. It's only gotten even better. Right. Sure. And, and more supportive. So I'm very lucky at that respect. The assistant coach told me, you know, he's like, it's tough to look at these analytics without going to your coach's eye or your coach's, your gut feeling, because he goes, he put it into context for me. He's like, Mike, am I going to put, let's say if I have a young player, second year in the league, in the playoffs or in an important game for us to win points, to even get that wild card spot. So that's like our Stanley cup, right? Right there for us to where we want to go with our organization. Very important. Right. Am I going to put a player at a face-off in our defensive zone against Sidney Crosby or whoever, right? That is 70% on the face-offs that night. Or am I going to put an experienced Tommy Hurdle, Logan Couture on that face-off against him that he knows the tendencies he knows what side of the ice we're on. He knows, you know, what 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 he, what what Crosby's been using for his his move that night. You know, even if that veteran player is four out of six on faceoffs, you know. So there's there's so much kind of like, yeah, you're right, you know. And and I think, look, we don't have to, like you said, you don't have to. I, I played the game from nine to twelve and just kept loving the game, and I got lucky enough to work with it in college, and I started to do. You know, you just start to get immersed in it, right? It becomes part of your DNA and now that I'm a hockey guy or whatever, you know. But um, I think that's it, it's important for us to at least know those types of things, right? And to, to talk in the same language as the coaches. And if you don't know the identity of your team and your coaching staff, then how big, are you going to program? Big time. That's, you know, I've said it on previous podcasts and I've probably the listeners roll their eyes after I bring this book up again, but it's such a great book and, and the, the, it's a brilliant, he's written several, but Gerd Gigerentz or gut feelings. He talks about living in three different worlds. You live in a world of certainty. It doesn't exist. You live in a world of probability where you play the slot machines and you live in a world of uncertainty, which is sports. And the problem at times is when you're using data, you have the ability to look back at that data and tell a story. It already happened. There's no uncertainty. Yeah. And the, the risk that you have at times is that you might use that data and an algorithm in the future where 75% of it's noise. It's not the important stuff. And you're essentially making your predictions, for lack of a better word, with more noise than signal. And he argued this idea of heuristics or trusting your gut in an uncertain world. It happens over years and years and years of experience. It's not just someone that just got introduced to the game. You build those gut feelings and you have to be able to respond on the fly, much like we just talked about with right. who's, who's putting on a face off or who's getting on the ice during certain times of the game. So certainly mm-hmm. think it's it's important. Want to pivot here. You and I talked about this off air. Wanted to chat with you the kind of the guts of your philosophy in terms and measures of management versus development. A fun way that I always try to use it, management versus development. Dan Pfaff kind of refers to it, managing like in season 82 games, right? Development, the season's over. So I, I want to start really with, with in-season, this management aspect. I want to ask you a question on your opinion from your experience. I, I see this happening in minor hockey as well. You know, death to the maintenance phase, get strong in-season. I'm not arguing that. I'm framing it. I can tell you from my experience, uh, not at the National Hockey League level, we see elite major midgets and minor midgets. Uh, we've tracked data on them for you know anywhere from two to seven years. And when I say marginal gains, very, very, some, some metrics go down during the season, body fat, body comp. And, uh, you know, I always say compete versus compliment. You know, we're, we're trying to compliment what we're doing. We're not trying to get Tommy's bench press up 30 pounds. Now we're not trying to have him get weak either. Um, but this idea of what's the most important thing right now, and that's playing hockey. So I'm just curious your thoughts on it, um, in terms of how you manage that and what your goals are for that in-season period. Yeah. Great question. And, and, you know, I, I, I think I am one of those voices, like I've presented on it with Kevin and, and Jim Laval and, and uh, I don't like the, the term maintenance, I think, because it's a mindset thing, you know, sure. if, if players, and maybe some coaches, which I hope they don't, it's if you think maintenance, you know, I thought maintenance for the first seven years of my job here in the NHL, it was like, okay, I'm going to put, you know, three by five up, four by five, three by 10, whatever, you know, just, we have to get something in, you sure. know, I, and, and I'm, I, I don't know if I really knew what that meant at the time. I don't think I did, you know, but at the, t- it, you know, so the maintenance thing for me is just a mindset 
Because if I have a young player coming in thinking, oh, I just got to go in the gym, I got to check the box and I'll be good. But this same kid who's walking into the gym is 19, 20. He, he truly needs an off season, obviously two, maybe three off seasons to <laughs> get that NHL engine. You know, it's like, I can't wait. Like I gotta, I gotta give this guy some sort of intensity and plan it out systematically and with some thought in season to get him doses of what he needs. We're not going to make him a 25 to 32 inch vertical jumper. Absolutely not. Yep. But at least he knows, okay, I have a purpose when I go up there, I got to make sure I have enough intensity. So I have enough jump on the ice, you know, and, and that goes for the veterans too. You know, it's sure. funny because when just by necessity, sometimes we just have to, we have to do some of our lower body training the day before a game. Right. Yep. Yep. And the veteran guys are like, I feel good. And I, and I was like, man, I really don't want to do it. I'm worried they're going to be sore the next day. But then guys were like, I really like doing it the day before because I feel ready to go for the game the next day. I'm like, okay, maybe there's some sort of potentiation thing going on there. So I stuck with it, yep. you know, and they really liked it. So the in season for me, at you know, it's, it used to be my, I always say it used to be my like off season where every strength coach, especially in college, like you love planning for the off season because yeah. it's the biggest block of time, you know, and you can use all of your periodization yeah. schemes or whatever you want to talk, you know, and it's yep. uninterrupted, you know, it's yep. most sports, but it flipped for me because I only, if I have the guys for three months or two months in the off season, that's rarity. It's great. You know, but the biggest bulk of time in the calendar is when I have them is in season, probably like nine months. Sure. Right? So sure. I really have to make an impact. With that. And it's probably more from habitual or habits, um, developing habits in some of these guys. Right. So Fantastic. I think for us in season, we, we, we do have to inject some intensity and it's really strategic as to where we put it. We don't do something every non game day. You know, I'm not, I, I, I do kind of like the micro dose idea but for us. I think I would lose more guys than I would, than I would, uh, than I would get, you know what I mean? Sure. So, so we, you, you know, there's just some days where, you know, we, we have to train and there's some days after games we have to train and there's some days we're like, all right, it's just mobility. It's just knock the cobwebs off. Yep. They're dog shit after the game. We don't sleep well after the game. We have subjective sleep scores to show that, you know, and, um, oddly enough, you know, we have better sleep scores on the road and it's because oh. we practice later. It, it just, because we're the visiting NHL team, you know, huh. So it was just kind of so they get an extra two hours to sleep in. Oh, absolutely. So, so my job is to knock the cobwebs off, get their nervous systems to some sort of level and, and kind of uh, preparation so that the coach can have a productive practice, you know. Pull the so. fire alarm and don't burn the house down, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that answer your question? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. During this management portion uh, in season, what are some of your anchor points or metrics that, that, that you are interested in in season? Is it sleep scores? Do you calculate internal, external load? And if you're comfortable sharing those, what do you find value in, in, in terms of not only the gut side of, you know, how does the athlete feel? How are you? But kind of trying to objectify that and buttressing up that uh, subjectivity to the coaching staff. Yeah. So we will, we will weigh in every practice day and in every one of those practice days, we have a uh, subjective uh, wellness uh, questionnaire, right? Okay. So it's, on mood, based on fatigue levels, it's based on your hours of sleep, you know, and, and fortunately enough, guys are, guys are, are great about, you know, so look, you're not going to get in trouble. I just need to know what you're coming in with the next day. If sure. you, case in point, we have a bunch of players that go to bed at like three in the morning after a game, whether they're, you know, jacked up on the caffeine that they were using to get up for the game yep. and they'll get four to five hours of sleep, you know, and it's shitty sleep. So I need to know that for the next day and if we can somehow put them back together right sure um we talk we ask if they're if, if they have any illness we have to if they have any, any new injuries that we have to work around and then our monthlies are total movement jump on the force plate we have a static uh, squat jump on the force plate where it's just you pull the yep. bottom take off hands on hips and then um trap bar three to five rm bench for, for those who can right for yep. those who yep. can um and then front squat for uh for with a gym aware for for speed yep and then if they, they can't do that and we need a single leg variation then we do that and we just Fantastic. Practice. those are our meat and potatoes with the nhl the only one that we add into that from a strength standpoint yep. for the american league is uh, a six second watt bike a wing gate so we okay. make that like 
okay, you're going to do three sets of a six second wing gate. So that's your explosive, you know, your yep. power lift for today, if you will. So, and then we draft it out and we, we, we show it to management. We yeah. have, management's really cool about, I have my primary, secondary and tertiary needs physically for each player from the preseason. Mm-hmm. And we talk about how we're tackling those in season. So a guy who may need some hypertrophy or whatnot, um, we'll look at body fat and weight a little bit closer and talk about is obviously nutrition. And we'll, 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 we'll discuss that at our monthly meeting, which pretty much go monthly or every 20 games, right? For a guy who needs more power, we really look at the drop off of those, the, the jump scores to see if we've lost anything, especially if it's a young guy, did he lose any power on that wing gate, that explosive measure, right? Sure. But the coaches, which is great. And I hope I'm not deviating too much, but I got to the point where it's like, you know, I sat with each coaching staff from the American League and the NHL, and I said, let's go through every single guy because I'm going to show you my, what I think they need. Tell me from a game perspective what you think they need because we've had conversations and confusion around like, I got this guy who's in the gym and he's my best guy. He's my fastest. He's my most powerful guy, you know, but he's also, he's also the most explosive guy I have. But you're telling me, like he can't win a battle in the corner, you know, and I'm, I'm okay with that, but let's figure out instead of bitching about it, let's talk about why he's having that trouble. So yeah, such a good, guys, such a good point. Sorry to interrupt. Such yeah. a good point. Reg was talking about that, getting all the, 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 either the coaching staff, again, in a perfect world, everyone's, everybody's different and constricted by different constraints, but getting yep. that feedback from the coaches certainly goes a long way in terms of measures of what you want to do, regardless of what you think right. needs to be done at times. Right. And you know what, it, what it's done is, and I don't know, I don't know if it's, it's just, I don't know if it's groundbreaking, probably not because it's such a simple conversation we're having where we're getting the, everybody in the room to discuss it and not, not uh, just leave it. Like if it's truly development and we want, and we believe in these players, then, okay, let's give them the tools to get them to where we want to be and, and make them NHL ready or even a elite, you know? Sure. Um, you know, like, so it gives the coaches the opportunity, one for me to learn what, they're seeing, you know, because I can't watch the game and I'm like, he's slow, he's out of shape, you know, I can't do that, you know, fully. But it gives us, it gives me an opportunity to hear from the coach. So then I can go in, program, and then the coach, I'm like, okay, I'll take care of my the programming on my side. You got to take him after practice and work on the battle because his feet are too close together and he's getting knocked over. Yeah. So it's a technique thing. It's not sure. a strength thing. Let's check the box there, rule that out. Now it's on both of our groups to make sure we give this player what he needs, NHL or AHL. It's such a complicated game. Sometimes I tr- I do try to simplify it in my brain, but you know, at times I've come up with this idea. Uh, obviously, strength is important. I don't know, you know, and and you you can see this perhaps. I don't know if you've seen this in, in the National Hockey League level. Someone that's really fast off the ice, but the game speed with the puck is, is it's a little bit different, right? Um, or the fact that, you know, that an individual can be strong as a bull off the ice, yet get pushed over by a gust of wind on the ice. This idea of, uh, I think Eric Cressy said it a long time ago, sometimes our goal is to build this these efferent beasts when in actuality some of the best players are efferent sensory beasts. They know where to be. They have, again... I'm not taking away from the importance of strength training. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. It's just an interesting phenomenon at sometimes. Just some players are just. I agree. Do you ever see that? I mean, do you see I, that as well? Yeah, we've had, this is kind of funny. Like some of my strongest guys in the gym who were the slowest guys on the ice. And a lot of it was technique, you know? Yeah. And a lot yeah. of it was like, and I think, you know, we've all yourself and me and Kevin and, and, uh, Jimmy Schneider's done a great job of it. You look at the skating mechanics and like, oh yeah, from a force application standpoint, where this monster in the gym is skating like this, like it looks like he's cycling, you know, instead of pushing. Like he has no opportunity to take the force and the strength that he's developed and direct it into the ice, recover that stride and put it back into it. It's more like my my the heels coming up, my heels coming up, my heels sure. coming up, and and you know, like it's like well look at his stride like yeah. if we can get him to like patty marlowe was fast as shit i think yeah. we all know that right yeah but patty didn't look like he didn't have a high turnover sure he was so strong at putting power right. into the ice that he he just projected himself you know 
yeah so uh, we i see it, see it all the time you that's, know, it's that's, that's crazy uh back on the, the the metrics how do you communicate it i know you talked about your um you know your trap bar your counter movement jump is it something that is communicated to players you know on a monthly or weekly basis where there's a report card kind of like hey you know Testing is training, training is testing, but how do you communicate that to the players is maybe a better yeah. question. I, I don't, I don't have a report card, which I got to do a better job at. I got to develop one, believe it or not. Yeah. And, uh, but I do have, I, 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 t- I sit with them and I, I show them, I, it's easy to show them in our kind of show. Sure. Like, Hey, here's where you're going. Here's what's dropping. Yep. And things like that. So I do tell them, Hey, this is your data. Like, this isn't just for management. This is your data. You need to look at it as your investment to see and track where you're going, yep. you know, yep. um, it, they, they truly believe that and appreciate that. The other thing that we do is uh, internally, we're looking at heart rate every practice, right? Okay. So I can sit with them and, and go over each practice to see how their heart rate recovery on specific drills. Now, where we got to get better as an organization is, I, and I, I think, I think we're, we're a good place to start is I'd like to get a coaching drill and I try to do this with the last coaching staff and, and uh, it really went well. And now this coaching staff, we just need to, just need to get them to, okay, let's, let's just put it into place. They believe in it. It's a good strategy, which give me your best drill. That's more, most game. Like, let me track it. That can be our conditioning test every, every month or every two weeks. It's just a drill. Yeah. Let it into, I love it. And now let me track that drill from a recovery standpoint. So when you tell me this guy's out of shape, and then I pull up the, the heart rate and be like, he's getting 70 beats in a minute. Like he's not out of shape, you know, maybe he's overworked, but like he's most certainly not out of shape. So that would kind of be our baseline metric rather than just doing a test. That is, that's, would, a, that's a brilliant idea, by the way, I, yeah. for so many different reasons. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I mean, you're, you're, uh-huh. you're on the ice. It's taking place at a practice. It's specific to what the coach is, thinks is important, which is even more, right? And you're able to, you're able to pick up that data without bothering the athlete. Hey guys, we're going to, what a great idea. Lose. Yeah. You don't, you know, there's no, there's no cadence. You don't lose anything in your cadence and, and you know, it's not invasive to everybody, including the coaching staff and then the players. So, so to kind of backtrack, I'll show the guys their, their data on their file within the first beat too. And then the workload reports go to the coaches too. So that's kind of the other piece of the report that goes to, goes to the group, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of metrics. Uh, in, it just, you know, I want to, I want to get up the blood metrics next, but re, re in that first beat system, I, we use it in our, in our private facility. There's a million different metrics. We seem to hyper-focus on trim and trim per minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we explain it to the athletes as, you know, Hey, you know, uh, if, if I'm driving to Cleveland, your trimp is the gas that we're going to use to get to Cleveland. Your trimp per minute is your mile per gallon. Are those metrics, the ones that you're seeing value from, from first beat beating trimp and trimp per minute? Is that what you're focusing on? Yeah, hundred percent. And then it can take trimp per minute and trimp and put it into this acute to chronic ratio, right? Got it. That for me, like, is just, I want to show them where they are currently, but also where we've gone over time, right? Got it. It's kind of like the the kind of um, the the argument for the maintenance, right? Yeah. So most most certainly for the coaches and the players, right? You get to this point in the season, you're playing every other day, and it's just like, all right, I gotta come in, I gotta you know, pop yep. the, you know, check, click in to work, you know, and punch my card or time card or whatever, and then I gotta go and I gotta get on the ice, and it's like, you know, 82 games. That's what you're gonna deal with. You know, you deal with those dog days in in an Olympic year. They happen now and they're going to happen in march when we're playing every other 17 games in 30 days or whatever the hell it is you know so that helps me with the kind of the maintenance argument but we take in my report i give them the monthly snapshot of those workloads the coaches yep and the players have it available too if they want to come and sit but i give them the monthly shot of where we are but also the the yearly the macro shot because that snippet of 12 days of preseason 12 to 15 days of preseason is the highest workloads we're going to achieve all year. Yep. So if we can, if we can mimic that one day, once every two weeks, then, okay, I, I really truly believe, and it's been pretty successful here that we're, we're touching upon what we need to, from a game pace standpoint, we can't yep. achieve those workloads in September and all of a sudden just hover here the whole year. Right. And assume, assume the game is giving us our intensity. Yeah, it is. But for your top six forwards and your, top D pair. That's, that's who really benefiting, not everybody else. Yep. So, and it helps with overworked 
healthy scratch guys. <laughs> so. Absolutely. And return to play, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Blood, blood, blood. You have spoken about this in the past, and I know you have uh, worked with Dr. Is it James Laval? Is it yeah. Laval? Yeah. I wanted to ask you kind of a rifle-like approach. I know blood draws, there's probably thousands of biomarkers uh, that we could probably look, look at in blood. What's important to you and how often do you measure? And then I guess from an application standpoint, how do you use that with your players? Yeah, we've had success with taking, we always taken a preseason blood draw. We've done okay. before COVID. COVID has really affected <laughs> the cadence of what we're trying to do with blood and bringing people in to do it Sure. Uh, right now. But we always do a preseason one, a midseason one, and then something right before the playoffs. So we can okay. kind of check the engines. And, and I think that's the most realistic cadence that you can follow unless you have a customized, the, the, the customization of kits that have a certain number of, of markers has exploded in the last two years. So, you know, you could do it monthly. There's no, no doubt about it. Um, but for the bigger picture yeah. of the health markers, the performance markers, the food intolerances panels and things like that, it's probably best to do it three times a year. Cause that's a big yeah. draw. That's sure. a, that's a, but the, all of those tests are, I don't know, maybe 10 vials, you know? So, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so those are, that's a, that's a, that's a big draw that we, that we've done in the past. So it's like, all right, we probably don't want to, you know, <laughs> you talk about driving to Cleveland, like we're going to be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but my, my go-to markers for, for us are obviously uh, vitamin D. Uh, I want to look at re uh, blood sugar resting, uh, resting glucose levels in the morning, right? And I want to know if they're trending high. I want to know, you know, because you can, because you can change that just based on our schedule. We're eating at post game at, at 10.30 at night, and then they're not getting enough sleep. So your blood sugar and insulin levels that affect your hormonal changes are going to have, you know, going to be, it could be changed long-term. We've had sure. guys look like Greek gods, you know, and then all of a sudden the resting blood sugars are, 95, like that's trending high, you know? Sure. So that's a key one. Magnesium pools and trace minerals are critical. I didn't realize how important they were probably like, I think it's eight years ago when we first started the reports on the vitamin panel would come back and it would be, you know, magnesium low, copper low, selenium low, biotin low. So it was like, what is this? So, and then it was, Jim was great at educating me. He's like, you guys are anaerobic animals. Like, you're going to draw from those minerals to, you know, for, for your anaerobic metabolism all the time. And if they don't, if you don't have it, you're going to draw it from bone, you know, so sure. go down the road of stress fractures and things like that. So we, we most certainly do, or at least I put a premium on our daily vitamin pack has, you know, a, a high dose of, of trace minerals and things like that. And magnesium, obviously for sleeping and, and, and whatnot. So that's another key one. Your A1C and inflammation levels, another key one based on your training, your training model, you know, you got to kind of look at BUN and, and how your kidneys are affected. If you, you know, we've found at least, you know, a little bit of kind of uh, subjectively or, you know, at least in the blood work that we did at the end of the summer. Okay. One of the fortunate things like beginning of, beginning of August, I'll get like a shit ton of guys back where, you know, we, we all probably have like 30 we start with like 10 and then every week we add guys. So we have a good four to five week prep before preseason where everybody's around and skating together. So it's a good culture thing, at least for us. Right. Yep. But coming out of that, we noticed in every blood analysis that we did is that kidney function was just had an uptick. Right. And the doctors kind of pointed it out. And, um, is like, that the BUN? Is that the bun? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yep, yep, and creatine kinase and things yep. like that. Creatinine yep. levels. And things. Yep. Those are the ones you kind of, you have to look at. So they're like, yeah, it was a little bit of an uptick here is a guy's drinking enough water. I'm like, yeah, we're drinking enough water. Like, you know, but I said, we are like in a work capacity phase where I'm kicking the shit out of them every day and they're on. Mm -hmm. so, okay. So those normalized right after the first five days of preseason. So sure. you don't want to run them into the ground. It could be, a, I think if for me, it was a really good, okay, maybe we can inject a little bit more recovery. We don't have to go you know, four hard days. Why don't we go three and kind of break it up a little sure. bit, a little more, more spaced out. And it helped the older guys too, which is great. You know, so I back off from a four-day program for them and went to three-day. We didn't lose anything. And as a matter of fact, we probably gained more. 
Sure. Yeah. Now the practicality of the ant is like, okay, now, now I know this guy's, if, if, if this guy has good vitamin D levels, this is just a quick example. He's got really good vitamin D levels and he can tolerate vitamin C high doses. Then, okay, I'm going to give him that. I, I don't need to overdose the yep. vitamin D and have it piss it out and us spend useless money on supplementation, you know? So we get really specific, especially on the guys who have lower pools and burn through them faster. We'll give them more of a dose of a so, particular supplement. So if I'm, I guess there's three ways you could probably use this, right? Uh, number one, it's a shotgun approach where everyone's on a vitamin pack. You mentioned the energy systems being used, uh, magnesium, minerals, et cetera. So there's a, a really hyper rifle-like approach, which is very, very individualized, right? And then there's kind of that outlier approach where you're hitting outliers. Do you use it all like that? Or is it like, you know, 75% of the guys are, this is what they need. And then we, we hit those outliers every once in a while. Is that how it works? Yeah. There's a general, like, so if we're, for making, we're making our vitamin packets or whatever we put on the shelf, you yep. know, for us to have, I'll make sure somebody gets, and it's by hand. Like, so I'll, sure. I'll make, like, okay, this is for this player. Put his number on it. Make sure because I put my more vitamin C in in his. You know, sure guys who are over two twenty five or two fifteen. I, I may put a higher dose than what I give one hundred seventy five, hundred eighty pound guy. Got you know, it. that kind of goes the same way for supplementation too. So if we had guys who are hard gainers, real lean, need hypertrophy, we'll do you know extra doses of HMB and amino acids, and then obviously with like a leucine kicker in it too. You know, and and, and make sure that they have. They have that. So there's some general things that we put out, but then we add to it. To Got it. Very, very awesome. Uh, well answered. I, I want to stay with this idea of managing in season. Your staff has grown. You have an assistant strength coach, correct? Mm -hmm. How do you objectively rate yourself in season and your staff? I, I, I know that there could be many different ways, wins and losses, man's games, loss to injuries, communication with the players. Does that all fit in? How do you, how do you objectify yourself? Um, you know, I, I, I think I don't, unfortunately I don't have anybody. Uh, we, we don't get a lot of evaluation period here. Okay. You know, I'm not sure why, but, you know, I never, yeah. never really, why I don't, I don't, I mean, we, I talk with management a lot and, and find out how things are going. What do we need? I, I'm, I'm, we're, I'm driving those, those questions. It's not a full formal evaluation. Sure. But at the same time, we, we meet at the end of the year and I ask, okay, what do we need to be better at? What, what, if more, what more information do you need as the general manager or the coach? Um, and I lean on them to, to, to kind of say, okay, Mike, we, we need this. We need that. You know, if it came to it, Hey, you know what? We need to be better communicating with the coaches on where you're at with injured guys, you know, that's never come up, but those are the types of things I expect to hear, you know, and, and sure. I'm a big boy. Like, just tell me <laughs> what the pain points are. And, and, um, you know, and I know where I, 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 I'm hard on myself too, because I'm like, you know what, I gotta be better at communicating, you know, at a regular interval the year, it has its challenges for any position amongst a, a, an oh, NHL yeah. team. Um, but you know what, that's the battle I gotta fight. It's like, Hey, I, as much shit as I got going on, like I, I gotta get this report to them in a timely manner, you, yep. you know? My staff, which is uh, my assistant, Steve Delestro, my head strength coach for the um, Barracuda, our American League team, John Germain. And then we have an hourly position who works with the Junior Sharks. He works with, uh, he's a student at San Jose State. So great. whenever that, that position evolves every year, pretty much, which is great. Yeah. So I'll evaluate them at the end of the year, you know, and talk about, I, I'm, talk about their communication, talk about their action with the, with the athletes, talk about their their coaching skills, you know, are they, you know, are they, are they, are they just standing around having a cup of coffee, bullshitting with the guys while other guys, you know, are doing stuff with bad technique, you know, it's kind yep. of the, my, those are my important things. Sure. Um, and then we talk about, okay, where can we get better? Where, where, what more can we learn, you know, from a data standpoint, from a data presentation standpoint, and then what do we need? That's, what do we want to learn that's out there now from an evaluation and, and, and uh, you know, help ourselves keep growing. You know, I think too the skill set side. It's like okay, we we all got to take an Excel course offered by the company, which is you know we're in Silicon Valley, so we, we're lucky enough yeah. to have you know resources within our organization that we've learned from with Excel. I'm just using that as an example. Like learned a lot of good tricks from 
from that, you know, and it's like, you know, do we get Tableau and do we learn that? Is it because it's more versatile and thing, you know, something to that nature? You know, how can we get better? Sure. So. Sure. I want to contrast now. So now we're going to talk about this development period uh, off season with the players that are here with you. How do you pinpoint program goals? And then what are your three to five anchor points that you really want to look at to measure progress during the course of the off season? Yeah. So if everybody, everybody gets a program, you know, okay. and hockey, I got to believe hockey is pretty unique in the fact that, you know, over 90% of the guys have their own personal strength coach and they go back to in the summer and close to their lake house or whatever it is. Right. So sure. Um, Just curious, do you communicate with them regularly? Do, do those, do those, do those private strength coaches typically reach out to you or do you reach out to them? I most certainly try to reach out first. You know, like I definitely want to touch base with them at least once. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a long call list to talk to everybody. Unfortunately, a sure. lot of it's, you know, I know. So I, it's an easy call or, or we're yep. talking all the time anyway. Yep. But you have to, you, you have to talk to them. You know, you've got to put the egos aside and, and just say, look, I got, we, we got to, we got to stay in communication because the guy that loses is the player. And a lot of time, well put, well, and, a well of, put. and a lot of times th- there's always that perception. The player thinks he's one kind of a player, but the team wants him to be something else. And that goes into identity, but there's a training to match the identity, right? You know, yep. so th- this, the personal strength coach should know that from the team's perspective, like, Hey, we want this guy. He's 185 pounds. We need him to be solid on the forecheck. He's got great skills, but if he doesn't forecheck and he just waits for the puck, then it's not going to be effective and he's going to be in the American league or traded. So, you know, if that type of player needs more speed power or hypertrophy type work, then they should know that the player knows that leaving. And to back it up, if he doesn't communicate that with the personal strength coach, then that's where the, the, the beauty of the conversation comes in for myself and that strength coach, right? Especially in a rehab situation. So, so yes, I, I, I try my damnedest to reach out to everybody at least once and some guys it's it's more often but yeah again you have to so sorry um, i got you, i got you sidetracked there but it was a fantastic no. answer but I, I i sorry again i sidetracked you i was asking how do you pinpoint program goals I, I'm, I'm sure you talked about with the coaches getting in a room with them and then what are your like your four or five anchor points that you judge so and, and to give you kind of a snapshot on how how we approach it so at the end of the year there's ex- exit meetings right yep and those exit meetings are a shit show like everybody, everybody, <laughs> wants to, nobody wants to do a friggin' exit meeting, including the coaches, right? So <laughs> but that's the time for us. That's the probably one of the most important times for us to sit down with each guy and yep. most certainly the staff, you know? Yep. So I, going into the off season, I, I, <laughs> I tell coaches, I'm like, I know you don't want to do this right now. You got other shit on your mind, but I need 10 minutes. I need to go through my roster of what these guys need. And I need your feedback on where you want them to be as a player or what you're seeing. So then we, we match those lists up, both American League and NHL, okay. right? I'm good from there. I don't need the coaches per se after that until the dust settles and we can meet and they want to give more feedback specifically on guys or wants to give me feedback in my department, right? Sure. So I take that, I build a report card at the end of the year pretty much and it gives them, it gives the player all of that, the metrics we talked about. It's in a one pager. It's all populated per month when we did the testing and when we didn't. Sure. And then I map out underneath that on the same page, I map out the phases that I believe they should go through, right? So some guys may get tissue remodeling, hypertrophy one, hypertrophy two, strength one, strength two, power one, speed. We run out of the, that's pretty much the whole summer, right? Sure. And then hey, we got work capacity and then we have training camp. My older guys, my veteran guys go, For example, tissue remodeling, strength one, strength two, speed power one, speed power two, work capacity, right? So everybody has this this own prescription. We have all these phases built and and all these progressions, and then we just plug it, plug the phases into bridge, right? That's just our platform, right? So the player sees that, and I say, hey, what are your goals? Here's my goals for you. You tell me your goals. I'll type them in, I print it out, and then they have it in their hand to give to their strength coach, right? Or I PDF it and then send it to their guy in the summertime, right? At the bottom, there's a narrative. There's a narrative of like, hey, you know, he needs to gain more weight, needs to really focus on speed power. We see some things drop off during the year. And I say, hey, listen, this is what I'm going to give to management and coaches. Like, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to send this exact, I'm not ripping you. I'm just saying, hey, this is where we can get better, you know? 
and the player appreciates that and it's it's transparent so it's not like i'm saying hey you're doing great just go back and train hard and then leave and then i go and talk shit behind your back you know it's sure not, it's really not like that um so that's what they get leaving the bridge program is so they have it in their hand and now there's a responsibility on them to to follow through you know and it's okay that they don't do the program as long as they have the communication between myself and their private strength coach that they know what they need to work on and should come back. Prepared. So what that's just, that's brilliant. That's fantastic. I, I can't speak on, on, on your behalf. Cause I, I, you know, I, I don't, but it sounds like, I mean, you know, someone goes off the entire summer, you know, without this communication and not knowing, I mean, you have no clue what's going on. And then right. if someone does get injured, more than likely it's probably coming down on you. It right. could, it could exactly. be four or five months of just not good training. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so right. I live in the fear that like, if I get my most fearless, my well, the question I fear the most coming from a coach or most special management is, is if they ask me about a player this summertime and they say, and he's an important player and, and they say, how's he doing? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, yep. and I'm not a liar. Like I can't lie. You know, like I, I, I don't want to tell them, oh, he's doing great. Like, you know, I'm just honest. I'm like, Hey, I haven't talked to him in a month, you know? So that's yeah. what, that's a little motivation to not only end the year off like that and make yeah. it a priority. Cause I'll make it a priority, both in the American league and the NHL. I got, Hey, I need five minutes. I know you want to get out of here. I know the boys are going to Vegas, you know, for a couple of days, like come to my office. I'm going to give you this paper. We're going to talk about it. We're going to, we're going to add to the goals or not. And, and then we'll go from there. And then. Yeah. If you're still in town next week, come in for a coffee. We can talk about it in more detail. Yeah. You know? So I got to start there, make it a priority. Because, again, sorry for the long-winded answer, but guys want to blow out of there. But I learned, at least in friends in baseball, it's, it's pretty friggin' rigid. Like you got two days of medical, orthopedic, meeting with the strength coach, meeting with management, or, you know, or the managers of the baseball team. It's like, shit. You know, orthopedic assessment, range of motion assessment. It's like, we got to do that. Like, we can't just be like, hey. Thanks for the year. See you later. You know? Sure. So are your anchor points very similar in season and off season is, it, is essentially the same. If the players are staying in San Jose, maybe is the best question for the off season the yeah. development. Is it the same anchor points that you look at and measure? Is that what you're tying it in season off season? I do more. I do more speed testing, you know, both dry land and both on the ice. In okay. the off season. You know, Great. so that's, that's the caveat. It seems like I do. We've done more with the 1080. We've done more on the ice and off the ice with the 1080, which is great. I think yep. Matt Price is Matt Price is kind of leading the charge there. He's got a great system, legit, and, and handles the logistics well of sure. getting these guys tested once a month at least with the, the 1080 sprint and obviously his quantum. So we're pushing yep. for that because we have to know what speed is. You know that's important. So there's got to be. I know I went through the preseason doing it, and then and then you, you split your team up, and then it's like okay, we got. You just again, you're juggling flaming chainsaws at <laughs> most of the time. So, but that's that's really important to me. And obviously, Mike talk, Boyle talks about it a ton, and um, to everybody's on the speed kick. You know, and I don't think everybody, yep. anybody really ever got off it. It's just that it, it's it's becoming more of a priority now. And, and Tony Holler and Matt Reyes, yeah, obviously leading the charge as well. But you know, I think th those are those are critical things to look at in the summertime too. Um, you know, you can't, you can't ask them per the CBA. You, I can't, I used to have them send back some test scores. Hey, if you can vertical jump, I don't care what apparatus this is. Let me know. Let me know your body weight. If you can sure. body fat, great. Let me know. Can't do that anymore because of the CBA, you can't really ask them. So to send any information back, but in my conversations, my one-on-one -on -one conversations, I will ask those types of questions. You know, if a guy's training with Mike in the summertime or Jimmy Schneider, I know their timing. So I'm like, hey, what are your times over there? You know, what is, you know, maybe an, uh, you know, maybe a f an airdyne ride or something like that. Three sure. more three mile airdyne, you know, so things like that. Um, hypertrophy wise, hey, what's your body fat? What's your body weight? How are you maintaining it? What's your supplement re um, routine? You know, things like that. So they're kind of, you know, side conversations that you have to have now because you can't, you can't technically ask them to send information back per the CBA. Sure. Last uh, pivot here, last uh, question. You know, I, I had, again, the opportunity to, to, to speak to Reg here, and he talked about the Strength and Conditioning Association of Professional Hockey and uh, kind of the pioneers. He said that at, at one point, and I'm sure you were one of the, those on the sofa there, on the couch there in Toronto, sitting in a, a room talking about how to better 
uh, yeah. quantify. I think he said Peter Twist. I think he's talked to Lauren Goldenberg. Um, I'm not I think that Sh- old. I wasn't- <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get him for that one. I think Sean Skayan and, and they, it was, is a brilliant conversation. I couldn't believe it. Like literally th- those ideas spawned from that. So how is the current program evolved? And then what's your current role as you're the president of it, correct? Yeah. yeah. So, so what's your current role on an annual basis? Yeah. yeah. So when I first came in the league, it was Roger Takahashi was kind of the guy really pushing and he, he would most certainly have been you know, with Lauren, with Reg, with Peter Twist and, and, and getting the group to be unified, you know, and Reg was right there. I think he was Roger's vice president at the time when I came in in 06, but it most certainly needed to be done to, to get everybody together for many different reasons, not only for, okay, where is our position in the league? How are we viewed in the league? You know, and I think, I think we're looking at like, 95, 1995 is when teams started getting a full-time strength coach, you know, it would probably run parallel to when Mike was with the Bruins and Pete Friesen was doing it. Um, Pete Friesen was doing both roles, you know, because Pete was passionate about it, you know, that's just something unique, you know, but, you know, I, th- I think it needed to be done because the league has to, the league now, the league was very much a, athletic trainer and equipment manager type league. And that was, that was the group, you know, sure. and now we're kind of not, not new anymore. We've been here and, and, and we need to, we need to be involved with the conversations in the league that affect our area. Right. Sure. And also, so supplementation policies or preseason testing policies shouldn't go through the medical group. You know, it should go through us, which it does now, you know, so we have a voice. And Roger fought really hard with the league. Reg doubled down on his his demand for communication with the with the league, and and I I I do that too. You know, I don't I don't get pissed much, but you know, I'll, I'll get pissed in, in you know and voice my opinions in the conversations with the league when we're not involved in decision making. You know, so sure. um, which which they need to know where we stand. You know, so. Um, on the day to day, it's, it's taking the communication for the league and dispersing it through all of our constituents, the guys in the NHL and the guy yep. in, the, guys in the American league, you know, I'm proud to say that we're, we're together under one umbrella under this name of strength coaches association of pro hockey. And we're, that's awesome. We're, we're pretty much unified ourselves to the point where MLB, NBA, and I think the NFL uh, respect, obviously respect it, but they're, they're we have, con- I have conversations with those guys about how we developed our structure and, and, and our kind of, you know, the other side is like, it's, 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 it's partially a business whose goal is to develop some sort of retirement for guys working in the league. You know, like there's, it's very limited what you get for our, for working as a strength coach in the NHL and yeah. in the American league. So my goal is from the business side is to develop resources that we can monetize and, and obviously educate with, with people who want to get into hockey performance and, and we could put some money in our pockets. And if, and if something happens to someone's family or house burns down or something, then we have a little bit of an emergency fund to help them. And, and we also maybe can give them something for their years of service if they're not in a league anymore, for whatever reason they leave, you know? So that's the, that's the goal of it. And there's a lot of other facets I don't know if we have enough time for, but, you know, the business side is mostly driven, is, is most certainly driven with the goal of educating everybody and anybody who wants to get involved. In, the, in in hockey, you know, both can you, the level can, you, all the way up to the pro. can you talk to them about the podcast, the SCAF podcast, and the website? Yeah, the website was developed about a year ago. We were putting content on there, much like uh, the format of hockey strength and conditioning um, was, and and most certainly what strengthcoach.com is. It's mostly very specific to hockey, obviously, and everybody who contributes there. The podcast has kind of been fun. It's David Rosales and I, and David runs. He's the administrator of, of our, our website and things like that. That's been fun because we've been able to connect with guys who've been in the league and, and learn from their experiences and, and learn their timeline, which I love. I can sit and listen to guys like, hey, where'd you start? You know, where'd you go to school? How did you get into it? Kind of what were your influences? So that's been that's been fun. Um, so that's uh, that's that's been great. We got more coming with, obviously with 2022 and we have a couple events that we we do from an educational standpoint, one with the athletic trainers and the equipment managers. And then, you know, excitingly enough, Scotty Livingston, who was spent a lot of time in the league, is hosting his International Hockey Performance Summit in Mont Tremblant this summer. And, and you're going to be a part of it. And I'm going to be a part of it. But the other side of it, the other prior to that, the Friday, we're going to have, SCAF's going to have a, a 
a seminar, a one day seminar with guys from the NHL and guys from the AHL presenting on different topics and then finishing the, the first part of the day with a, a round table and then finishing the night with a round table. So we're, we're, we're excited about this kind of stuff. That's fantastic. And for all the pioneers sitting on that sofa that day, thank you for all of, uh, from all of us. Uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate the sacrifice and, and, and continuing to evolve performance, specifically strength and conditioning in hockey. Our guest today has been Mike Potenza. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it.